Hey guys, how are ya? See, just for you guys, I wore a blazer and a white shirt that needs to be ironed. Just for you guys, so you guys would stop complaining about the t-shirts. I need to get, I gotta buy some casual wear, right? Because I don't have any, but oh my, hey, that's okay. Well, the ones I have are kind of old and outdated, but hey, it's life. Life will never be the same. How you guys doing? I decided to do this even though I didn't iron the shirt. Man, I thought I had blocked Idiotai Apologetics. How did he get unblocked? How did you get on, man? I thought I blocked you, bro. No, that's it. I just did that. What's up, Marcy? Yeah, I just did that because I don't want people to talk. Hey, man, you're always wearing T-shirts, man. Well, what is it? Because you can't afford any shirts from Walmart? Keep praying. I thought I did, idiot. I know I blocked you from Facebook, but that's okay. We'll work on that. All right. Good to see you guys. We'll just wait for the regulars to show up. As you can see, it's a little earlier. I don't know. I gave you administration power. That stinks too. All right. Sorry about that. You guys know it's like a unique and special day, right? Yeah. Oh, aren't we sensitive? Ooh, I'm going to leave that. Bring me some toilet paper because, you know, we bought two months supply of toilet paper because of the coronavirus. <laughs> Today is a unique day. You know why it's a unique day? Number one, my firstborn, my baby, turns 10. The two greatest gifts that Jesus gave me on earth after revealing himself to me and granting me salvation. Today is my firstborn's 10th birthday. I've been a father for 10 years, and I praise Jesus Christ for my Soraya and my baby girl, her sister, Zipporah, whom I named after Moses' wife. I praise Jesus Christ, my Lord, for them, and I pray Jesus loved them bless them, flood them in his peace, love and joy, and wash them in his blood, and seal them by the Spirit, that their Baba will see them grow up to be godly women in love with Jesus. And if Jesus tarries, I go home to be with the Lord before they do, in Jesus' name. I will be doing a video a little later, right, telling her happy birthday, God willing, if the Lord wills. And also today marks the sixth year anniversary of my blessed mother, leaving this world and entering the presence of Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus in his love blessed this day and made it a special day for me because March 12, 2010, my first angel entered my life, Sariah. And then another angel was sent to me by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ about two years later, October 26, 2012. <clears throat> another angel came to visit me and live with me, Zipporah. In fact, just let me tell you a little bit about their names. Saraya Ariella. Saraya means princess of Yahovah, princess of Yeshua. I named her to honor my God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and to honor the God-man, the Lord Jesus. Zipporah, I gave her that name. Her name is Zipporah Brooke. Her mother gave her the name Brooke, the middle name Brooke, but I gave her Zipporah because of Moses, his wife was Zipporah, the daughter of Jethro, of Raul, Ragul. And I love Moses because Jesus loved Moses, right? Two angels were given to me to complete me, my, my girls, and I love them. The Lord Jesus knows how much I love them and ache for them, but Jesus loves them more than I can imagine. And at the end of the day, they belong to him. Not really me, they are his, for his glory. They were created for his glory. And may they glorify the Lord Jesus, the one whom I love more than them. Even though I love him imperfectly and I fail him and I pray Jesus has mercy on me and forgive me when I fail and help me to overcome and be patient with me. Jesus is my life. Jesus is my God. And I'm not just saying this. And I'm, I'm saying it from my heart. And I'm admitting I fail him daily. And I struggle with carnal desires that all too often... I give in to too easily and may Jesus have mercy on me and crucify my flesh to hate my flesh for his sake. But I want to say this in front of every one of you. Some of you were worried that I'm sad. Let me tell you something. My peace, my joy is Jesus. 
not my daughter's. My happiness, my joy, my love comes from Jesus. My joy is Jesus. My love is Jesus. My happiness is Jesus. Long before there was a Sariah and Zipporah, there was Jesus. Sariah and Zipporah were not there for me when I was a child. Jesus was. And Jesus is still with me and will be with me till the end. So I know you guys are concerned, and I thank you for your concern, and I love you for that, because that means you love me for the sake of Jesus. But I want you to know they are not my life. Jesus is my life. If I do not see them until glory, so be it. I'm not trying to be a hero or a martyr. I'm not. I'm telling you. These two years where I haven't been able to put them asleep and wake up to them, I can bear witness. I'm going to bear witness. Jesus has shown up in such an amazing way. He's given me such peace and love and joy and calm, calmness. It's miraculous. Even on this day, I woke up at peace. I woke up calm. I woke up full of joy because that's my Jesus. That's my Lord showing me that he is my peace. He is my joy. And as much as I love my daughters and miss them and ache, ache for them, and in a sense empty without them, they do not fill me. Jesus does. So I just want you to remember that. My concern is they won't be damaged irreparably because of the decisions of their mother to walk contrary to the will of Christ and because of her immorality. That's my fear. I don't want them to be irreparably damaged. Right? So pray for them and love them for the sake of Jesus. Second thing I want to mention, why Jesus is so amazing. Among other things, he is amazing because he's God. But things he does to show us how real he is, how close he is, close he is to us, and how much he loves us. My daughter was born March 10, 2012. I'm sorry, March 10, 2010. My baby, my baby angel was born October 26, 2012. Okay. On March 12, see, I'm getting the dates confused. You see, I'm old, Alzheimer's. God saved me from error. Lord Jesus saved me from mistake. March 12, 2010. March 12, 2010, my first angel came to my life, to be part of my life. March 12, 2010. My baby angel, the second one, October 26, 2012. Then on March 12, 2014, when my first angel turned four, my mother left this world and was born of heaven. You understand what the Lord Jesus did, right? My beloved mother, and I was the baby of the family. I'm the youngest of six. I was her baby. I was her baby like Zipporah Zippy is my baby. The day that the Lord Jesus summoned my mother into his presence was March 12, 2014, when my firstborn turned four. And you know why? So that every time I think of my mother, <clears throat> I remember on that day, my angel was born. And that's Jesus's way of comforting me. And I used to tell my daughter that. I go, you know why, Nana, your grandma was taken she goes, I know why. The Lord took her on my birthday to make it easy for you because when you see me, <clears throat> you get happy. I go, exactly. Jesus uses you to heal Baba's heart. Right? So glory to the triumph God, glory to the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. I love my girls, and on this, on, on this side of glory, in this world, I love them the most. And I die for them, as any parent would. I'm not, I'm not special here. I ache for them in a way I'm empty without them because I want to be there to make sure they have a godly influence and protect them from any man so no harm comes upon them and no irreparable damage. But Jesus loves them more. And at the end of the day, whether I see them now or I don't see them, they are not my peace, my joy, my love, my life, my anchor. Jesus is. And I just want to remind every one of you, Jesus is. I'm not just saying it to say it. As I'm speaking here, I'm telling you, I have joy in my heart. I have a peace in my heart and I am calm. A calmness that you know is from God. You know it's from the triune God. You know it's from the Father. You know it's from the Lord Jesus. You know it's from the Holy Spirit. And I thank him because though I fail him, and I failed him today, he 
has mercy on me and he forgives me and he washes me in his blood and he has pity on me. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, son of God. In fact, to celebrate my daughter's birthday and to commemorate the memory of my mother who entered the presence of Jesus six years ago on this date, I'm going to do a double header. She turned 10. My oldest is 10. My youngest is seven. She's going to be eight, God willing, October. Guess what, folks? I'm going to do a double header today. I'm going to do this session, and then several hours from now, I'm going to do a second session. I'm going to make today special to honor my daughter's birthday and the memory of my mother who's now alive in the presence of Jesus. I'm going to do a double header. So God willing, after this session and a couple hours from now, I'm going to do another session. That's how we're going to celebrate. What better way to celebrate but to glorify Jesus Christ, to praise Jesus Christ, to praise Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ, and speak about Jesus Christ. Right? Anything? Is there anything better than that? Come on now. I said that tomorrow I was going to do a session proving the Holy Spirit is a person. Guess what? I'm going to do it today. It will be a double header. The second will be on the biblical evidence proving the Holy Spirit is a person who is God, one with the Father and the Son. How about that, folks? Are you excited? And I'm doing it because I want to serve you and be used of the Spirit so that all of us together glorify Jesus Christ. Are you excited? Okay, now triune alone matters. You know, I'm going to give you advice and I'm going to block you so you don't come back to this session anymore. You just bore false witness and you lied about me. See, again, the distractions of the devil start. You said, because I don't believe in the filioque, you feel sorry for me. So do you feel sorry for a large segment of Christianity, the Orthodox Church, the Nestorian Church, even the Coptic Church that don't accept the filioque? And do you also feel sorry for the original ratifiers of the Nicene Creed that did not include the filioque in it? You see now why he's feeling sorry? You would think that the filioque would be crucial to one's salvation. So if you affirm it or you deny it, it can affect your salvation. You see the silly things that Christians argue about? Did you guys hear what he just said? I feel sorry that you don't accept the filioque. If you go back, we were talking about the procession of the Holy Spirit. And I'll go back to those series. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father through the Son or the Father alone? The Orthodox, the Nestorian Christians, which is the church of my ancestors, though they don't hold to the heresy of Nestorianism, even the Coptics, from my understanding, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, believe that the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father alone. The Western church, for the most part, believes that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. And that phrase and the son is filioque. So he's telling me he feels sorry for me because I don't affirm that the spirit proceeds from the father and the son and the son part. So he feels sorry for me because somehow that makes me less spiritual than him and maybe even puts my salvation into jeopardy. Right? Hey, wasn't there a song about jeopardy? On in a jeopardy, baby. Ooh, remember that one? Okay. But anyway, let's send our friend. This is not a channel for him because he feels sorry for me. So that means he should be listening only to those who affirm the filioque. And you got Catholic answers and other people that do. This is not for you, friend. Send them away, mods. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. And shamefully, I say, we love you imperfectly. I do. First, I ask, Father, that you forgive us for our shortcomings, our failures, our moral imperfections. Father, have mercy on us for the sake of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. Fill us with power and life from your Holy Spirit to overcome the flesh, to crucify the flesh, to mortify the flesh, and walk in the life and the power from your Holy Spirit, Father. Please help me in this area. No matter what, Father, please never turn your back on us. We plead the blood of Jesus to cover us. Give us grace and power to overcome, to become more like Jesus, 
more obedient, <clears throat> more worshipful, more prayerful, obeying you more perfectly, conforming to the image of the Lord Jesus, being like Jesus in the way we love and the way we live and the way we <clears throat> worship when Jesus was on earth, setting the, the example of how to worship you, Father, in the power and life of the Holy Spirit. And to serve like Jesus by our deeds, not just our lip service. Help me to be a doer of your word. Help every one of us to be doers of your word, Father. And bless this session, especially on this day, when we celebrate the birthday of my first angel, Soraya. A gift from you, Father, from your heart to me. And then you sent me another gift, her sister Zipporah. Bless these two gifts. Seal them by your spirit. Flood them in your love. Cover them by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. And bless this session also as we commemorate the home going of my mother, who's now in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Though her physical body returned to the dust, her spirit, her, her soul is alive, fully alert, free of sin and pain, beholding the physical face and the physical body and the beauty of Jesus Christ, worshiping you in the presence of those who've gone before us with the company of the angels. And I pray in Jesus' name, by the blood of Jesus, by the cross of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, we will join them until Jesus returns to the earth. Strengthen my, my throat, fill my lungs and chest with the breath of life. Anoint me to speak truth without error, to make no mistakes, no errors of fact. And exegete scriptures correctly and bless everyone with wisdom and knowledge and insight. Understanding from your Holy Spirit to understand these issues, Father. And bring more people to this channel for your glory to learn, to benefit, and be blessed to fall more passionately in love with you, Father. More passionately in love with Jesus. More passionately in love with your Holy Spirit. And have mercy on us, Father. And help us to forgive those who've opposed us, attacked us, slandered us, who hate us. Either because we love the Lord Jesus or because of our shortcomings and we've offended them. Forgive them, Father. And forgive us. And help us to forgive them. Have mercy on my ex-wife. Convict her. Be a fire in her heart to fall before the feet of Jesus and return to Jesus Christ, her only hope of salvation. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Help us. Help me to bless your people in Jesus' name. All right. Lord, bring them, Lord. We pray. We get. We had close to 200. Hopefully it keeps going that way. Okay. Are we ready? I, should, I was supposed to put part two, man. I forgot. It is vitally important that you listened to yesterday's session because I can't cover in depth and detail all the things already discussed. That was the foundation that I laid by the grace of God. So I'm going to be building on that foundation in Jesus name, trusting the spirit to prevent me from error, illuminating me, enlightening me to speak truth clearly and helping you absorb all this information for the glory of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your support. God bless you guys. Right. Yep, it is a continuation of yesterday, Max. It's supposed to be part two. I'm probably going to lose you in the way. So if you haven't listened to the first session, please don't ask me to clarify. That's why I did a first session. I'm going to build on the foundation already laid. Make sure your questions are relevant to the topic and no side issues, no side talk so that you don't distract others it's because this is meat and we want to dig into the meat and absorb it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, now with that said, you guys understood the difference between monotheism as defined by Christians today and henotheism, right? Right? You understood. I already explained those terms, went in-depth on it yesterday. I want to continue from where I left off because if you remembered, I said that according to liberal critical scholarship, the kind of scholarship that does not believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God. Believe that the Bible is a collection of books that contain errors and myths, you know, anachronisms, historical mistakes. This kind of scholarship believes that if you look at the oldest materials in the Bible, which is also circular, begging the question, because they're the ones who assign the dates to these documents, and then they're the ones who determine which document is old, which document is recent. So it's all circular reasoning. It's begging the question. It's not based on historical, textual, archaeological facts. It's based on assumption, right? So I want to repeat. It's based on assumption. These <clears throat> claims are 
assumptions that are not anchored in facts of history, facts of archaeology, or the textual evidence. So I just want to repeat, this is the position held by liberals. Not all of them, many of them, but it's a position that's not based on historical, textual, archaeological facts. Is that clear? Because I want to repeat that. I want it to sound like a broken record. Is that clear? Understand? What I'm telling you is what liberal scholarship teaches. Pray I lose. I got to lose 50 more pounds and keep it off in Jesus' name. What liberal scholarship teaches, but it doesn't mean because they teach it, it's true. In fact, the historical, textual, archaeological facts, proofs, show they're wrong. That these assumptions are wrong, if not outright lies. Is that clear? I just want to make sure that you don't think I'm endorsing these views or I believe these views or I subscribe to these views. Is that clear? I just want to make sure you're getting this. No, Tommy, you don't need to remove Tony. Tony's actually agreeing with us. He's a brother in Christ. Okay. So with that said, the liberal assumption goes like this. Just like you have evolution in, in science, you have evolution in religion. They believe that the Israelites, because they're pretty much West Semitic people that coexist with the Canaanites, that their religious views come out of Canaanite religion. Their religious views were shaped and formed and derived from the beliefs of the Canaanites, who were pagans, right? And then in time, Israel's views went from being polytheistic to monotheistic. And these scholars will tell you that the Israelites became monotheistic during the Persian period when the Persians attacked the Babylonians, the, the throne the Babylonians, and let the Jews return to Jerusalem after they were taken captive in Babylon. Clear? May not be as entertaining these sessions, but they will be informative and educational because I'm trusting the Spirit to enable me to present these facts without error. Okay? So up until the Jews returned from Babylon and the Persians conquered the Babylonians during the Persian period, the Jews were not monotheists. They started as polytheists, and then they progressed into becoming henotheists, right? And you could say they became monotheists, but not monotheists the way we understand it, because these scholars will say even up until the time of Christ, they were still henotheists, okay? And I defined these terms yesterday. Now, I'm going to even quote to you some of these sources. For example... Thank God for modern technology. It's a fingertip away. Here's a book written by someone who doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. He may claim he does. Who doesn't believe the Bible is historically accurate. Who doesn't believe it's inerrant, without error. Who believes it's a collection of fallible books that give you a very contradictory portrait of God. And even says that in the Old Testament, Yahweh is presented as a genocidal deity. Let me repeat. He believes that the Old Testament depicts Yahweh as a genocidal deity, a god of genocide. Okay, So he wrote a book called The Human Faces of God, What Scripture Reveals When It Gets God Wrong, Okay, by Tom Stark. Now remember I said yesterday that according to liberal scholars, the oldest material in the Old Testament would include Deuteronomy 32. These scholars believe Deuteronomy 32, um, yeah, Deuteronomy 32, Exodus 15, that Psalm, right, Judges 5, and even perhaps Psalm 82, those are the oldest sources in the Hebrew Bible. And if you examine them carefully, they'll tell you, you'll find traces of what the Israelites originally believed. You'll find things said in these sources, especially Deuteronomy 32, that escape the pen of the scribes that gives us a window into what the Israelites originally believed. So everyone with me here, am I confusing you guys? Do you want to make sure you're getting this before I move on to the next point? So here's the link to his book. I don't recommend you waste money on the book. If you can get it in the library, do so. And I can't. Uh, anyway, it's too long. The link. Sorry, guys, I can't get. I, I was going to send you the link, but it's too long. Too long. Anyway, you can find it. You do 
The human faces of God, Tom Stark. Okay. Here's what he says about Deuteronomy 3, 2, verses 8 to 9. You got to go back and listen to this session to understand what I'm saying now because I'm building on it. Now, notice what he says about Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. Let me, let me read it to you. Okay. Citing the Dead Sea Scrolls in regards to Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. Because remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest existing copies of the Hebrew Bible to, to date. We found copies of virtually every book of the Bible, with the exception of Esther, right? But who knows? Maybe future discoveries will find Esther as well. And these books of the Bible written in Hebrew were written anywhere from 200 to 100 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the oldest copies of the books of the Old Testament in existence. We may find older ones in the future. So this is what he says about that phrase. I want to read it so you can hear it from the horse's mouth what these people believe and what they're teaching. Okay, but let me see. One second before I go there. Does yeah? Uh, let me go to the relevant parts. I'm going to read it. I'm not going to read it in chronological fashion. It's going to be haphazard because I just want to read the salient points. Let me go there and find what he says about Deuteronomy 32. It's it's dating because he mentions it here. Yep. All righty then. Let me find it. Lord, help me. I had it right up and then here. All right. Let's see if I can find it. You see? Now when you want to find it, you can't. Sorry, guys. This is what happens in life. So I had it right in front of me. Oh, brother. From a different mother like no other. Okay, let me see. Let me find it for you. Send him back to Asheron. I Sorry about that. Just bear with me because I want you to see what he says about Deuteronomy 32 and how some scholars view Deuteronomy 32 as one of the oldest, if not the oldest, material in the Old Testament. Why can't I find it now? It's unbelievable. I hate this. All right, I may have to can it and come back. Yep, because, we'll see, Lord Jesus rebuked distractions and Satan. Unbelievable. When I want to find it, here it goes. Oh, here, here. Sorry, it's on page 70. The Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. Pay attention. The Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, alongside... The Song of Miriam in Exodus 15 is considered by scholars to be some of the oldest material in the Hebrew Bible, dating back roughly to the mid 13th century BCE, before Christian era. Guys, remember to ask me about that date. Scholars believe that Deuteronomy 32, along with Exodus 15, and they even say that about Judges 5, and possibly Psalm 82. Deuteronomy 32 is considered by scholars to be some of the oldest material in the Hebrew Bible, dating back. Remind me to explain the importance of this statement. Dating back roughly to the mid-13th century before Christian era, BCE. BCE means before common era, but they're trying to rob Jesus of his glory and erase his name from even the date, the dating of our calendar, right? And I'll comment that in a minute. So before Christian era, mid-13th century before Christian era, meaning 1,200 years before the birth of Christ. The Song of Moses tells us the story of Yahweh's victory over the Egyptians and his deliverance of his people. And in verses 8 to 9, we learn something about how Israel originally came to be a people belonging to Yahweh. Now, let me skip to the other relevant part, his explanation of the Dead Sea Scrolls version of Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9, which I spoke about yesterday. So you must have heard yesterday's session to understand what I'm saying here. Now, look what he says. The Hebrew text says, according to the number of the Bene Ha Elohim, the sons of the, the Elohim, God, which means the sons of the gods. This phrase, Bene Ha Elohim, is a common Semitic phrase that refers to the junior deities in the divine pantheon. I'm going to explain all these. Divine pantheon means the council in heaven where God presides as king on his throne with a host of spirit creatures. I'm going to explain this. Be patient. I'll get to this. So that's what he's referring to. Okay. It is well attested in the ancient Near Eastern literature, meaning the other ancient Near Eastern peoples, the pagans, also believe something similar. They believe there was a heavenly council where the gods convened and there was a chief god among them. And this is especially too true of the Canaanites. Remember, Israel lived in Canaan, intermingled with the Canaanites. We found text from Ugarit. Ugarit is a place in Canaan. 
We found texts from you, Garrett. In the last century, archaeologists uncovered some texts from you, Garrett. You, Garrett, is a place in Canaanite. So these are Ugaritic texts. These texts give us an idea of how the Canaanites worship and the gods they worship. Now, before I move on, is everyone with me here so far? You can you can Google you, Garrett. You, Garrett. Hold on. The archaeological finds in Ugarit, Ugaritic texts. Archaeologists uncovered, the, unco uh, uncovered these ancient texts that give us an idea of what the Canaanites believed and how they lived and how they practiced their religion during the time of the Israelites, shortly after Moses. There's no buffering here. I don't know when you say buffering, it's on your part. Okay, so everyone Okay. So now before I read the rest of this, let me explain what we learned about the Canaanites. You guys ready? And I'm going to read it here. I'm going to read it from this man's mouth who's a liberal. Okay. It turns out that the Canaanites, the Canaanites, I think so. I, I, I have done seen wrong, but I haven't read it all the way through. Okay, guys, pay attention. It turns out the Canaanites also believed in a heavenly council, right? And at times, like you had Mount Olympus in Greece, that Mount Olympus in Greece, where the Greeks believed that was the mount where the gods would come down and convene. They also believed that the gods would meet in a mount called Zaphon. Zaphon. And the Bible mentions that, by the way, Mount Zaphon, right? They also believed that's where the gods would convene. Now, the Canaanites believed in a council of gods. And the king of the gods... Guys, you got to really listen. It's a lot of information. I'm going as slow as I can because I want to bless you and help you understand the issues. What's being taught, not just by liberal scholarship. This view is also espoused by evangelical Trinitarians like Mike Heiser. Mike Heiser now champions this position, but not with the liberal underpinnings. I'll get to that. Just listen by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Be patient with me as I try to go slow with this. All right. They believed the chief god of the council, his name was Il. He was also called Il Elyon. Elyon, God Most High. <clears throat> he had a consort, a goddess. In fact, he was known for having a very strong sexual appetite. And the literature describes that he had a large body part, male organ. Sorry, but this is just to tell you how perverted the pagans were. Just okay? And so he had a goddess as a wife, and he had 70 sons called the sons of Il, 70 sons. One of his sons, some would say he wasn't listed in the 70, but he was a son of Il, was Baal, Baal. Il, the father of Baal, Baal. Okay. Baal was also known as the writer of the clouds, the cloud writer. He was the one who would ride the clouds, right? He's a fertility god, right? <clears throat> so understand what they believe. Following with me what the Canaanites, now who are the Canaanites? The Canaanites are the people that Israel dispossessed and intermingled with. Notice what they believe. The chief god, his name is Il. He's also the most high. He's the father of the gods, 70 sons of Il, right? And one of his sons is named Baal, Baal, who rode the clouds. And Eel had a goddess as a consort and a wife, and he would have sex. Yep, fertility rights involving words, right? Do you got you see? This is what they believed, right? This is what the Canaanites believed. And these discoveries from you, Garrett, confirm that's what they believed. Okay, if you're with me so far, this is where the liberal scholars say. Because the Israelites were a West Semitic group, perhaps they were even Canaanites. Some would even postulate that. Not all. They were influenced by this religion. And when they broke away, they still took bits and pieces of that religion. But then they changed it, modified it. Let me give you a similar example. Let me give you a similar example. Muhammad. What did Muhammad do? Muhammad took the paganism of the pagan Arabs that he was reared from, you know, that re re reared among them. 
He took pagan elements, pagan beliefs and superstitions, and married those beliefs with Judeo-Christianity, and he created Islam. So these liberals say that's what Israel did. That's what Israel did. Are you with me there? You understand? They say Israel did the same thing. They were pretty much steeped in the Canaanite religion. And then in time, they changed, they adapted, right? Embellished that religion and omitted, omitted things from that religion that they didn't agree with, similar to what Muhammad did. I don't know. Ask uh, Matt Stevens. That's your mother because I know you're upset that you don't know who your father is till this day. That's your mother's fault, not our fault. But anyway, are you with me there? You understand what they're saying? And so what's the proof? You ask them, what's the proof that the Israelites, like the Canaanites, believed that Il was the chief god and that there was a council of gods who were the sons of Il? And what's the proof that at one time, the Israelites thought that Yahweh was one of the sons of Eel, because that's what the liberals are saying, that the Israelites originally started out thinking Yahweh wasn't the supreme God. He was the son of Eel, one of his sons. But later on, Yahweh becomes Eel, Eel becomes Yahweh. They become one of the same deity. But originally, they didn't believe that. What's the proof? Their proof is their reading of Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. So now with that said, let me continue. With that as a background, here's what this gentleman says. The New Revised Standard Version takes some interpretive license and translates the phrase according to the number of gods. Now pay attention. As it happens, this interpretation is fairly accurate. As already noted, throughout the ancient Near Eastern literature, the Semitic phrase among the Semitic people, Bene Ha'arahim, occurs frequently, always meaning the same thing. Junior deities, lesser gods. I'm saying lesser gods. He's saying junior deities of the divine pantheon. The notion of a divine pantheon with a chief deity, deity at the top, a consort, wife deity, and their progeny, their offspring that they sire, all comprising the council of the gods, was widespread throughout the ancient Near East, not least in the Canaanite mythologies. That's what the Canaanites believe. In the literature, this council convenes, these gods gather together, to talk politics, as it were, to determine the order of things. So far, so good? I got two more paragraphs. God willing, I want to read. So far, so good? You understand what I'm saying? All right, let's move on. Interestingly, in the Canaanite literature, one deity is typically considered to be the head of the pantheon. This deity's name is El Il E L Elion. El Elion. El Elion is the god served by the priest king Melchizedek in Genesis 14. God Most High. Melchizedek blesses Abraham in the name of God Most High, El Elion. El or Il is the generic term for God, but El Elion, Il Elion, God Most High, is the king over all gods in the region of Canaan. Upon Ilion's mountain is where these political councils of the gods are said to convene. So now he reads Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9, from the Dead Sea Scrolls version. Now notice what he's going to say. In this early piece of Israelite poetry, remember that Israel is in Canaan. We have a picture of one of these councils of the gods. These verses reflect an etiological, it means giving you the root and the origin of, of the people groups, where they got their name, how they inherited that land, and their beliefs, etiological narrative, explaining the division of nations. In it, Elion, the mountain god, head of the divine pantheon, divides humankind according to the number of his children, the junior members of the pantheon, so that each get a people group as an inheritance. Yahweh, one of Elion's sons, is given Israel as his inheritance. And here's the key. Here's the key. Thus Yahweh becomes Israel's patron deity. That is what is envisioned here in the oldest extent Hebrew text of Deuteronomy 32. The oldest copy that we have of Deuteronomy shows that Yahweh is one of the sons of Eel, of the Most High. He is not the Most High. And Deuteronomy 32 is one of the oldest materials 
that we have in the Hebrew Bible, possibly written around the 13th century BC before Christ. Everyone got it now? Understand what these scholars are teaching? Okay, now here's his note. This is from pages 70 to 73. 70 to 73. Let me read the note here, okay? Six. Some scholars argue that Elion and Yahweh are the same God here, but the most straightforward reading of the text does not permit this. First, it is said that Yahweh is given an inheritance. A father does not give an inheritance to himself, but to his child. Second, the text says that Elion divided up humankind according to the number of his children, not according to the number of his children plus himself. Thus, Yahweh is portrayed here as a son of Elion. No, Max, it's not accurate in dating. Okay. So what I told you yesterday, there is an evolution in religion. You see how ev evolution has spread like gangrene and cancer in science? Evolutionary theory isn't just for science. Evolutionary theory is being adopted in all fields of learning, even in religion. So just like we evolved, so did the religious beliefs of people evolve, including the Israelites. In other words, according to this view, Israel never in her history believed in one God. And Israel did not originally believe Yahweh was the supreme God. Because these people groups started believing in a plurality of gods. And only slowly later, their beliefs evolved to monotheism. You understand what you just read? I don't want you guys to fall asleep and get bored. Here's another one. This is another one from the pathos.com. It's called Cross Examine, another liberal. Another liberal who writes about the Bible. Here's the link. What does he say about Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 82, which is what we're going to talk about today? We're going to talk about Psalm 82 today, okay? But here's what he says about Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. Notice again, just like Tom Stark. Notice, two independent writers saying the same thing. Why? Because they're drinking from the same pool of liberalism. What's the link between them? They have <clears throat> imbibed liberal poison, liberal theology, and taken for granted that liberal assumptions are based on fact, right? So notice what he says. The Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, is considered to be some of the oldest material in the Bible, dating to the mid-13th century BCE. Just so sounds just like what we just read from Tom Stark. We have several somewhat inconsistent copies, the oldest being from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he quotes it. Now notice what he says. Here we see Elion, the head of the divine pantheon, Dividing humankind among his children, giving each his inheritance. The idea of a divine pantheon with the chief deity, his consort. Man, it sounds like I'm reading Tom Stark. It's like they're all reading the same script. His consort, meaning his, his wife, his female goddess that he has sex with, and their children, the council of the gods, was widespread through the ancient Near East. Elion, short for El Elion, or Elion, is the chief god, not just in Jewish writings, but in Canaanite literature. This passage concludes with Yahweh getting Israel as his inheritance. We learn more about terms like sons of God by winding our focus to consider Ugaritic Canaanite texts. Ugarit, Ugarit was a Canaanite city destroyed along with much of the ancient Near East during the Bronze Age collapse and roughly 1,200 years before Christ, BCE, before Christian era a period of widespread chaos from which Israelite civilizations seem to have grown. Now watch what he says here, and we're done. The Ugaritic texts, the text that they discovered, state that Il and his consort Asherah, remember this name, Asherah, had 70 sons, which may be the origin of the 70 nations or 72 that came from Noah's descendants listed in Genesis 10. There you go, folks. That's liberal scholarship for you. Did you catch it? That's what liberal scholarship is teaching people who are going to colleges, universities, and even seminaries. Did you catch it? And you know why that name Asherah should be important for you guys? Because all throughout the Hebrew Bible, the Israelites 
Keep worshiping the goddess Asherah and Estarte, Ishtar. So these goddesses show up in the Hebrew Bible by way of condemnation. Because the Israelites were worshiping the goddesses of the pagans. So these very gods and goddesses are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible as snares for the Israelites. Because Israelites kept being seduced into worshiping them. And archaeology confirms that these are the names of the gods and goddesses worshipped by the people at that time. So this actually provides archaeological confirmation for the accuracy of the Old Testament because it gets the names of the gods and goddesses of the people right. You with me there? Is, is this sinking in? And Abdul Halaj, my brother, is here to confirm. So you see why these scholars believe why these scholars believe that Jehovah originally was the son of Eel, the Most High, and then later on he became identified with Eel, the Most High, because of Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. Now, you do have scholars trying to refute them. For example, Michael Heiser has written papers refuting that. Michael Heiser, Michael Heiser has a paper that I actually read. Why Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9 doesn't distinguish Yahweh from the Most High, but that Yahweh is the Most High. So though Yahweh, the Most High, divided the nations among the sons of God, he kept for himself Israel. It wasn't that someone allotted him an inheritance. He chose Israel to be his inheritance. And the assertion that a father doesn't choose an inheritance for himself, so this again shows you the dishonesty, the deceit, or the ignorance of this writer. Who told you that the Hebrew Bible does not speak of the true supreme God inheriting a people for himself and choosing that inheritance for himself. Where are you getting this from? Notice the fallacy there. He's assuming that because today fathers give an inheritance but don't give themselves an inheritance, somehow that understanding must have been true for the biblical writers, that they shared that logic. You get it? I'm going to do a double header today, Andrew Martin. After I'm done here, several hours later, I'm going to do the person of the Holy Spirit. You understand his logic? Fathers don't give themselves an inheritance. They give it according to who? You in the 21st century or according to an ancient Near Eastern text? Who told you that the ancient Near Eastern people shared that assumption that the true God could not allot for himself an inheritance. Where are you getting this from? You with me there? Are, is this making sense or I'm putting you guys to sleep here? For example, let me show you what the Bible says about God inheriting. The true God inheriting. Which now brings me to the second passage. Psalm 82 verse 8. Let's look at it. Now, I'm going to deal with the second passage that liberals point to to demonstrate that Yahweh wasn't the chief God. He was the son of the chief God. And the second passage that Henotheists, to our Trinitarians, point to to show, although there's one true God, that one true God created a host of lesser gods. So let's read Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. There you go, my friend. The true God inherits the nations. So the logic that the true God can't apportion an inheritance for himself, that's not biblical logic. But now this brings up the second example, the second passage that both liberals and Trinitarian henotheists point to to demonstrate there isn't just one God. Okay, now are you with me? Because now we're going to go to the second example. Are you, are you ready now for the second example? Okay. The second example that the liberals point to, to try to demonstrate Jehovah is not the chief God. He's the son of the chief God early in Israelite religion. Let me repeat what the liberals are saying about Israelite religion. 
they say that early on the Israelites believed that Jehovah was one of the sons of the chief God. That's their belief initially. Later on, they started identifying Yahweh, Jehovah, with the chief God, so that the first stage, Jehovah is the son of the Most High, son of Il. Second stage, Jehovah is Il, Jehovah is the Most High. This is what the liberals are saying. That's their belief. Coming now to Trinitarians or Henotheists like Mike Heiser. Are you ready? Now, let me tell you what Michael Heiser and those scholars and apologists who believe like him are saying. They do not believe that Yahweh was the son of the Most High and only later on became identified as the Most High. They don't believe that. You with me there? Focus. They'll tell you Yahweh has always been the eternal true God. He is the Most High. But they believe that Yahweh, the true Most High, God Most High, created a council of lesser gods, spirit creatures who are gods, but not in the same sense that Jehovah is, that Yahweh is. That's what Mike Kaiser and other scholars like him believe. You understand the difference between the liberal position and Trinitarian henotheistic beliefs? A Trinitarian like Mike Heiser and those who follow his thinking do not believe that Israel initially thought Yahweh was different from the Most High Eel and then only later on thought, thought they were one and the same. They don't believe that. They'll tell you from the beginning, Israel, by revelation of God, always knew Yahweh is the eternal, uncreated, supreme, almighty, all-knowing, ever-present God the creator and sustainer of all creation. And he then created a host of spirit creatures to be lesser gods that make up his heavenly council. That's what Heiser and company believe. Okay? So their beliefs are not identical. They are similar, but not identical. How are they similar? Both the liberal camp and this camp of Trinitarian henotheists argue there is a heavenly council and in this heavenly council, you have the supreme God presiding. That's Jehovah for the Trinitarians. For the liberals, it used to be the Most High, who's the father of Jehovah, and later became Jehovah. That's the liberal belief. And in this council, there are spirit creatures who are gods, but they are junior gods, junior deities, as Tom Stark called them, lesser gods that the true God created, the true God sustains, who derive their life, their power from the true God, who are no match for the true God, and the true God can wipe them out of existence in a nanosecond. If you understand the differences, we can now go into the second text that they use to try to prove this belief. Happy go lucky. If you didn't listen to the first session yesterday, don't ask me questions until you do, because I covered all of this. It's not Tom Ender. He's getting it from liberal scholarship. This is what mainstream, liberal, God-denying, Christ-rejecting scholars teach about the Bible. Who is confused? Exactly, Pedro. Pedro, you summed it up beautifully. But don't forget what the liberals will say. They'll say, eventually... Yahweh became the Most High in Israelite thinking because there was an evolution in their beliefs. Yeah, you are a demon like your prophet who was a demon, a son of Satan, a whore. Send Zechariah to the Black Stone. Okay, anybody confused? If there's someone confused, let me know, provided you heard the first session and still are confused. First session was yesterday. Oops, sorry. Man, my computer almost died. Everyone got it? And by the grace of Jesus Christ, are you excited? Are you blessed? Are you learning? Are you growing? Are you being stretched? Glory to the triune God. Praise him for all this wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and the ability to communicate it clearly for the glory of Jesus. He gets the glory. All right. Here's the other Old Testament text that they cite. Remind me to explain 
the 13th century BCE date for Deuteronomy 32. Do you want me to explain it now or do you want me to explain it at the end? Why do these liberal scholars, not all of them, assign the 13th century BCE date to Deuteronomy 32? Let me let me explain that. Okay, now, all right. Okay, let me explain. All right, so there's enough you said yet. Yeah. All right, let me explain why. These scholars do not believe that the first five books of Moses were written by Moses. They don't believe Moses wrote these books, and they don't believe he wrote it 1,400 years before Christ, 15th century B.C. Now, there are some scholars that think that the Exodus was later, 13th century B.C. They believe the five books of Moses are a collection of separate documents, right? Four. The, they, the name of the four documents are the Yahwist source, the Elo, Elohist source, the priestly code, and the Deuteronomist source. These four sources were then edited and combined together in a cohesive whole so that the, the Torah that you have today was only finalized when the Jews returned from Babylon. So it may have sources that are from 600 years before Christ, 700 years before Christ, maybe even 900 years before Christ. But these sources separated independently were then combined together, edited into a cohesive narrative. And so the form of the Torah that you find it today was only finalized when the Jews returned from Babylon during the Persian period. Uh, you believe this? Then you're a dog. You need to get out of here. Get this dog out of here. The problem is your face. Come on, guys. Send him back to his mother. You want me there? You understand? So if the Torah you have wasn't written by Moses, but was a collection of independent sources that were collated, edited together, so that the Torah you find today was finalized in the form you have it today during the Persian period. That means the Torah can only be traced as far as 500 years before the time of Christ. Okay? That's why they'll tell you Deuteronomy 32 may have circulated separately, independently, and later on added to the Torah, because Deuteronomy 32 is very old. It's older than the sources that make up the Torah because it's from the 13th century BC. Do you see the circular reasoning? Wait, 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 wait. If Deuteronomy 13, 32 is from the 13th century BC, that means you've now taken at least one chapter of the Torah and pushed it way back during the time of Joshua. Or if you go with the other dating that the Exodus took place during the reign of Ramesses, during the time of Moses. So then why are you arguing that the Torah doesn't come from Moses when you're pretty much admitting that Deuteronomy 32 comes from that period where Moses and Joshua lived during the Canaanite conquests? You see the circular reasoning? So they're admitting to you Deuteronomy 32 does come from a time that puts, puts its writing within the generation that left Egypt and during the Canaanite conquest. So why not just say it all came from that period? No, we can't say that because we don't believe the Torah could have been written by Moses with editorial modifications made by Joshua because we don't believe the Exodus is historical. That's why you guys must watch the series of documentaries called Patterns of Evidence, where this man of God is presenting solid, overwhelming, historical, archaeological proof that Moses, Joseph, their stories are historical, did take place, evidence that scholars who are liberal either ignore, right, and brush aside. Now you see why those documentaries are important, especially his documentary, on Moses writing the Torah. He did that documentary precisely because of these liberal theories showing all the historical evidence, archaeological evidence that points to Moses 
writing the Torah, but which liberals either ignore and in their deceit and dishonesty do not mention. You know these liberals are used of the devil, whether they realize they're being used of the devil or not. Why are you hiding this other side of the story? Why aren't you commenting on these historical sources and archaeological inscriptions that at least will give us another side of the story and not just preach your story as the gospel truth and that there are no challenges or holes in your position? Patterns of evidence. Yep. Yep. Go to Amazon and get patterns of evidence. Did the Exodus happen and did Moses write the Torah? So again, guys, I want you to praise the triune God. Say thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that though Satan is raising up his armies of scholars to try to destroy the historical accuracy of your word, you are sovereign and almighty over Satan. And you are raising your soldiers to present the facts, to present the other side that these scholars, influenced by the devil, whether they realize it or not, are hiding or ignoring to their shame and destruction. Thank you, God, for being faithful to preserving your word and giving us confidence in it. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God bless you, Robert. You with me there? So notice... The irrationality, the circular reasoning, and the dishonesty and stupidity. You're telling me Deuteronomy 32 comes from 13th century BCE, right around the con conquest, conquest of Canaan. So you now pushed it to a time period within a generation or two of Joshua and Moses. So then why don't you just say all of it came during that time? No, because then that means our theory that the Torah was composed of four separate documents that circulated independently, of which there is no textual or archaeological proof. Folks, there's not a shred of textual or archaeological proof that the Torah originally consisted of four separate sources. Did you know that? Don't, I'm not making it up. When you read it, they'll tell you that this is based on the internal evidence. This is based on the document and how they read and interpret the document saying, oh man, this one, that must have been a separate source. So we're going to call it the priestly source. This one here, that must be separate because it uses the name Elohim prominently. So we're going to call that the Elohim source. So they make up sources from the top of their head as they go along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Haterwood. If I had your, your skilla, maybe I could buy a new set of clothes. So why don't you send me 20% of the million that you've made through ministry, and then I can go buy some new threads and look sharper than you, hater. You keep leaving me panhandling, especially when the judge is after me, hater. But anyway, everyone with me doesn't make sense. You understand how dangerous liberal scholarship can be and how it can be used of the devil as the tool of the devil to destroy the faith of your children. This is what your children will be taught. This is what they will learn when they go to college and university. This is what they're teaching them, called the documentary hypothesis. Let me explain where they came up with the word Elohist or Yahwist. Okay, here's, here's their assumption. Certain chapters in the Torah use the name Elohim prominently. And there are certain chapters where the word Yahweh, Yahweh doesn't appear. So they assume that must have come from a source, a written source, where the name Elohim was used. Then they say you see places where Yahweh is used prominently or exclusively. And the word Elohim doesn't appear. If it does, it appears scantily. That means these chapters must have come from a document where the name Yahweh featured prominently. Oh, so we just created two imaginary documents. A document where God's name was Elohim, a document where God's name is Yahweh, and then we find the same story, or it looks like the same story, repeated twice but differently. So that means this story must have come from this source, and this version of the same story must have come from a different source. So now we've created four sources. Yay! 
uh, excuse me, professor, is there any historical proof for, no. A manuscript evidence, no. Any art, none. Where'd you get it from? From my creative imagination and the way I'm reading the Torah. That's where you got it from? Yes. Ain't I smart? You get it now? Everyone got this or am I confusing you? I'll give you an example. Genesis 1, the word Elohim is used. Yahweh doesn't appear. But in Genesis 2, if you read verses 4 down, it uses the word Yahweh for God. And then they'll tell you the order of creation in Genesis 1 is different from the order of creation in Genesis 2. Voila, two separate sources. Genesis 1 is an Elohist source where Elohim is used. Genesis 2, which gives you a different version of the creation account, where the word Yahweh appears, must be the Yahweh source. Yahweh. Yay! I'm a genius. And this is what they pay me to teach. To destroy the minds and the faith and the confidence of people in the Bible. Right? Okay. With that all, that all said, yeah, that's also because they're trying to reconcile Genesis 2 with Genesis 1. With that all said, with that now in the background, are you ready now to look at the second passage, the second example that both liberals and henotheists use to try to affirm there is a council of gods in heaven, the chief of which According to the Trinitarians, is Jehovah Yahweh. Who's ready? I'm going to give you the liberal spin on it. Folks, are you shocked at what is being taught in colleges, seminaries, and commentaries on the Bible? All this information that people think are based on solid historical, textual, archaeological facts, proofs, when they're simply theories and assumptions. So do you feel safe sending your children to Bible college or universities, secular colleges, universities, where they may have a course on the Bible that will be teaching these theories and never giving them the other side of the story? See? Max is not shocked. Yeah. Remember the book recommendations. I gave you a recommendation by Gleason L. Archer, a man who went to be with the Lord, who was a genius, who, who read and wrote in 25 languages. He wrote two excellent books that you have to have. One of them is available online as a PDF file, Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties. You can find that online for free, PDF file. Gleason L. Archer, Encyclopedia of Bible difficulties, and he wrote a book surveying the Old Testament, a survey of the Old Testament. And this man goes into the linguistic, archaeological, historical proofs, decimating these liberal views of the authorship of the Pentateuch, the authorship of Isaiah and Daniel. These sources are a must. You must read them. And I also recommend a commentary on Daniel by Stephen Miller, S T E. P-H-E-N Miller, Stephen Miller, S-T-E-P-H-E-N Miller, his commentary on Daniel by the New American Commentary, one of the best refutations of the liberal lies and distortions about the authorship of Daniel. And they are distortions, they are lies, and I'm going to say it again, I know it's going to offend people. These liberals are tools of the devil whether they know it or not. I'm not saying they know they're being used of the devil. That's where the deception comes in. The devil has deceived them into thinking that they're actually speaking the truth, whereas they're actually speaking lies that's being passed off as the truth to destroy the confidence of people in God's word. It's that ancient lie of the serpent. Did God really say? Remember what he said to Eve? Yeah, did God really say? This is the same lie being repackaged. And now it's in the mouth of these scholars who think they're doing us a favor because they think they're being honest to the facts, making us now doubt the word of God, which is the oldest trick of the serpent. He started doing that in the garden. Did God really say? Did Daniel really write? Did Moses really compose the Pentateuch? Did the Exodus really happen? Did one Isaiah really write all of Isaiah? This is the same lie of the serpent 
that he used to dupe the original <clears throat> parents of mankind. Right? And this is the, the wicked brilliance of the devil. He doesn't care whether you know you're in cahoots with him. He doesn't care whether you swear allegiance to him. He doesn't care whether you know you're doing his work. He doesn't care. And yet people are carrying out the will of Satan, doing the work of Satan to destroy the faith of people in God and his word without realizing that's what they're doing because they think they're being men and women of integrity and they're simply presenting facts all the while ignoring the other side of the story, this massive amount of historical, textual, archaeological proof to show your statements are not facts, they're assumptions, and the facts refute you. Right? With that rant, let's go to Psalm 82. But we're going to use either the new Revised Standard Version or Revised Standard Version. Protestant, which one are you going to use? New Revised Standard Version or Revised Standard Version? Use one of them. You'll see why. Coffee. Which one do you want to use, Protestant? Do you want to use Re Revised Standard Version or New Revised Standard Version? Okay, no, no, it's it's RSV. I don't know of RV. Is that the Reino Valera? Is that the Spanish version? It's on BibleGateway.com. You don't have it? All right. It's first last year, you can't get it? I'll get it then. We got to use that version because it's actually produced. The Revised Standard Version was pr produced by the National Council of Churches, a group of flaming liberals. Nobody has? Okay, let me get it. All right, hold on. Let me get it. Let me get it for you. Don't know if I can copy and paste it, but Psalm 82, verse 1, Revised Standard Version. Hold on. Can you use this link or no? Hold on. Let me show you. Let's see. Why, wow, you little sinners. Here you go. Who can post from this link? If you guys can use that link, post fine. Here, let me give it to you. Now, we're going to go real deep now. Are you guys ready for meat? Who's ready for meat? Oh, you did it? Praise the Lord. You got it? Okay. Who's ready for meat? Any meat eaters? Okay, he posted it. Okay, let's read it. And I'm going to provide the Hebrew words for the terms God, divine, and gods. So you can follow. This is the second passage that both liberals and henotheists, whether Trinitarian henotheists or even Aryan ones used to show there's a council of gods. Okay. I'm going to give you a commentary that's going to shock you. Shock you. A commentary on Psalm 82.1 produced by mm -hmm. professors who, who claim to be evangelical Christians, scholars and professors, some of whom teach at Dallas Theological Seminary, the commentary that they provide for the new English translation of the Bible. Now, before you do that, Psalm 82, 1, Revised Standard Version. God, Elohim, has taken his place in the divine Eel Council. In the midst of the gods, Elohim, he holds judgment. Let me, let me post that again. Guys, you got to really now give me your undivided attention. You really got to listen to learn, right? I'm going to just pronounce the Hebrew. Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. Literally, it's the council of Il. In the midst of Elohim, he holds judgment. Did you catch it? The Hebrew says Elohim has taken his place in the council of Il. The council of Il. In the midst of Elohim, he holds judgment. All right. Now here, the Revised Standard Version translated the word Il as an adjective. It's the divine council. The council where divine beings gather. However, the Hebrew says council of Il. Council of Il. All right? Follow me, guys. If you follow me, you're going to be blessed, challenged, blown away, and even surprised. Okay. Let me see how the NET. Now, let me show you the New English translation. 
The New English Translation was done by evangelical scholars, some of whom are professors at Dallas Theological Seminary. So these are the scholars that provided the notes for the New English Translation. Notice their translation, folks. Here's the link. Thank God for modern technology. All of this is free. That means you don't have to buy these sources. You just send me your money for ministry. <laughs> just kidding. But no, really. Send me money for ministry. All right. NET. Here you go. God stands in the assembly of Il. Wow. New English translation. God stands in the assembly of Il. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. I got I to gotta post it again. Elohim, God stands in the assembly of Il. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. Folks, this council is said to be the council, the assembly of Il. Do you remember what I read earlier? Because of the findings at Ugarit, which is in Canaan, we now know that the Canaanites believed that the heavenly council belonged to the god Il. His wife was the goddess Asherah. Who he would have sex with her, and he sired seven, 70 sons. So notice that someone reading the Hebrew, someone reading the Hebrew would see there's an Elohim standing in the assembly of Il. Wait. Why doesn't it say Elohim is sitting in his own assembly? Here, let me let me let me post this again because you guys, it's not sinking in, man. It's not sinking. Think. Elohim is standing in the assembly, but the the God of the assembly doesn't stand. He sits. He's on the throne, but this Elohim is not sitting. He's standing. And he's standing in the assembly that belongs to Il. This almost suggests that Elohim and Il are different. They're not the same. Hmm. So you have Elohim. He's standing. He's not sitting. And if he was the owner of the assembly, then he should be sitting. But no, he's standing. In other words, imagine a court setting. You have the judge on the seat, and you have the prosecutor, and you have the defense attorney. Are you with me there? Are you listening? The prosecutor stands before the judge who's seated, and the defense attorney stands before the judge who's seated. Or you can have right a plaintiff, defendant, and then you have the judge. The judge is the one sitting because this is <clears throat> the judge's courtroom. And you stand and present your case before the judge. Notice Elohim is standing in the assembly. You with me there? That suggests he's not the ruler of the assembly, at least not here. He is actually the prosecutor standing in the council of another called Il, God, to now prosecute the other Elohim. Hey, Ram, if you ask me that question again, I'm going to send you on your merry way. You know that, right? What's your question got to do with my point? Ask me it again. Make my day. For the rest of you who are paying attention. Elohim is standing in the assembly of Il to judge the Elohim, the gods. So this Elohim is functioning as the prosecuting attorney, the prosecutor. He's bringing an indictment against the gods before Il, condemning them as worthy of death. That's the context of Psalm 82. Send Abraham out of here. Don't you dare come back. Send him out of here, please. Don't let this guy ever back here. Everyone with me there? Before I move on, here it is again, NET. One more time. Here, let me post it. God Elohim stands in the assembly of Il. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. Okay. You have this Elohim who's standing 
to pass judgment on these other Elohim, condemning them to death. So this Elohim is not seated on the throne. He's standing in the assembly, making his case an indictment against another group called Elohim. You catching it? Before I move on, I hope I don't have to do a third session, but I will do one because I want you to get the meat here. I want you to get the meat. Right? Do you know what the NET commentators and translators say about this passage? It's right here. Let me give you the link. They're also confused and baffled by the precise meaning of this passage, and they even pos posit an interpretation that I'm going to quote now that's going to probably shock every one of you. Here's the link. Okay. Well, I'm going to quote. It's their note C. Okay. Let me see where I, I posted it. Yeah. C. Watch here. Guys, get ready to be shocked. These are Trinitarian evangelicals. They're also baffled by the implication of this passage. Go there. You're going to see C. I can't quote it all at once. So I'm going to put it piecemeal. So do me a favor. Try to read before you comment. Let me blow you away. Thank you, Marcy. Oops, it's 300. Man, darn it. I can't even post that. <laughs> Guys, read. Instead of commentating, read, please. Okay. I'm going to post it. I want you to read. It's there. Be shocked what they're going to say. They're giving you different possible meanings of the text. Okay. Possible meanings of the text. All right. Notice one of the meanings that they offer and get blown away. Okay. Just hold on. Be patient. It's live streaming. Let me now get it. Okay, hold on. Don't comment yet, bro. My goodness, this dude. Just read, man. Stuck for Allah. Hold on. Endear. Do you want me to endear you somewhere else? Read, dude. Just wait before you comment so you don't lose the flow. It's almost done. I can't help it. It only allows 200 characters. My goodness. Darn it, dude. Watch here. Get blown away, folks. Get ready to be blown away. These are evangelical scholars, and they don't really know what to do with this text. They really don't know what to do with this text. I can't send you an email if you keep commenting and don't wait for me to finish posting. Okay, almost done. Here we go. Now let's read. Guys, I posted it for you, and I gave you a link. But what you can do is you can either go to the link reader or read what I posted. So let me read it for you. Guys, please pay attention to what the comment to this passage says. Get ready to be blown away. Psalm 82 verse 1. TN means textual note. The phrase adat il, assembly of il, appears only here in the Old Testament. One, some understand il to refer to God himself. In this case, he is pictured presiding over his own, uh, own heavenly assembly. So that's one view. Two, the second view. Others take il as a superlative here, meaning an adjective. God stands in the great assembly. Okay, so an adjective. As in Psalm 36, 6 and 80, verse 10. Three, third possible interpretation. This one's going to blow you away. Third possible interpretation. The present translation, the one they gave, the one that they gave in their translation assumes this is a reference to the Canaanite high god Eel. Oh, boy. These scholars assume it's referring to the Canaanite high god, the pagan god Eel, who presided over the Canaanite divine assembly. See Isaiah 14, 13, where Eel or El's assembly is called the stars of Eel. In the Ugaritic myths, the phrase Adat Ilim refers to the assembly of the gods who congregate in King Kirtu's house, where Baal, Baal, ask Il El to bless Kirtu's house. CGR driver, 
Canaanite Myths and Legends, 91. I have this book, but it's in storage, unfortunately. If the Canaanite divine assembly is referred to here in Psalm 82 on, then the Psalm must be understood as a bold polemic against Canaanite religion. Israel's God invades Eel's assembly, denounces its gods as failing to uphold justice, and announces their coming demise. For an interpretation of the psalm along these lines, see along these lines, see W. Van Gemmerin, Psalms, EBC. Did you catch it? Did you see what this evangelical translation says? They take the position that this is a psalm referring to the assembly of the pagan god Eel that Yahweh has entered and invaded to pass judgment on the gods and to kill them dead. Wow. You see what they're saying? Now notice how they get around it. Let me explain to you what they're trying to say. They're Trinitarians. But they're trying to argue not that Eel is really the high God and that this is really his assembly. What they're saying, watch here. Let me explain what they're saying. They're saying it's a polemical psalm where the psalmist is saying to those who believe in this pagan pantheon, the true God is powerful over your gods and your gods will be destroyed by the true God. So they're saying it's more of a polemic where it's like me saying, Jesus destroys Allah of Muhammad. Allah of Muhammad is nothing before Jesus. Allah is beneath the feet of Jesus, right? So they're saying it's polemical. It's not saying that this pagan pantheon exists. It's saying to those who believe in this pagan pantheon, hey, the true God, Yahweh, is greater than your gods. And your gods will bow before him because the true God will kill them and destroy them and damn them to hell. It's like when you say to a Muslim, Allah's not God. Allah's beneath the feet of Jesus. Jesus is greater than your Allah. But this view implies, let me explain to you the implication of this view. This view implies that the eel who presides in the council is different from Jehovah. You want me there? You understand this? Do you understand the implication of this view? That this council is not the council of Jehovah. It is the council of someone else. Right? It is the council of some other deity. And Jehovah simply shows up and appears. In other words, this interpretation indirectly supports what the liberals are saying because the liberals say this is a psalm that once again shows Jehovah is not ill. He's different from him. You understand what's happening here? I feel like I'm torturing you, but I'm trying to go slow and educate you how deep the scriptures are, perplexing the scriptures are, and what liberal scholarship is doing to God's word, to their shame and destruction and failure. Okay, so if you take this view that it's polemical, that the psalmist is not assuming Il is truly the God of the council, but it's a polemical rhetorical device saying, hey, you, you Canaanite, you think Il is God? Jehovah will destroy Il and his gods even in his own council. Jehovah shows up in his council to damn him. Right? But this view indirectly admits, let me explain to you what this view is basically conceding. This view indirectly admits that the council of Eel doesn't refer to the council of Jehovah. That this council doesn't belong to Jehovah because Eel here is not Jehovah. Exactly what the liberals are saying. But they're saying it for a different reason. You understand? The liberals are taking the same interpretation, but for a different reason. They're saying, yes, this is the council of Eel. And Jehovah is not Eel, and it's not his council. He's simply one of the members of the council. He's one of those gods. He's one of the gods of the council, but he's not the god of the council. 
Thank you, Ronnie. God bless you. You understand? What is the liberal saying? This is a psalm that shows once again, God, Jehovah, is different from Eel, and he's simply a council member, one of the gods that presides in the council, but he's not the god of the council, and he too is one of the sons of the god of the council. He's one of the sons of Eel. So they're telling you that this psalm again shows that at one point in Israelite belief, in Israelite religion, right? Yahweh wasn't Eel. Yahweh was the son of Eel, different from Eel. And only later on did Yahweh become Eel and Eel become Yahweh. Let me know if you're not getting it. Excuse my hairy chest. I got to shave. That's the liberal position, Jojo. Remember, NET is produced by evangelical Trinitarian scholars. So they're not saying the creator is not supreme. They're saying it's a polemic against the pagan god Eel. Just like you would say, Jehovah damn Allah, Allah is beneath the feet of Jesus. You don't assume that Allah exists. You're saying you who think Allah exists, you're Allah who doesn't exist, but you think so, he's beneath the feet of Jesus, the true God. Right? Yeah, Luisa, I'm, I'm going to take my time. Don't think I'm going to rush through this. Okay. This position that you just read, Luisa, by evangelical Trinitarians, they're saying this psalm is written to attack the Canaanites and their belief in Eel and the pantheon of gods. So the Israelite is saying to the Canaanite, hey, you know your God, Eel, and the council members? My Jehovah is going to destroy them all. In fact, my Jehovah is going to enter that council and damn them all to death because Eel and his gods are nothing to my Jehovah. That's what NET translators are saying. They go, that is a possible interpretation. That's the view they take. Okay? So, Luisa, you got that so far. And Marcy, everyone else, you got that so far. That's what these Trinitarians are saying. It's polemical. It's saying to those who believe in these gods, your gods are nothing. Your gods are beneath my God, and my God's going to damn all your gods and kill them dead. He's going to kill that pagan eel, his consort, and his sons. Damn them all. Liberals, however, are using the psalm for a different reason. They're saying, yes, Jehovah's not the God of the council, because he's simply someone who stands in the council as a member of the council. The God of the council is Eel, showing once again that Israelites didn't believe that Jehovah was Eel early on in their history. They believed that Jehovah was a separate God from Eel. Eel was the chief God even over Jehovah, and Jehovah was his son. And this is what this psalm proves. That's what the liberal is using it for. Right? Everyone with me there? Yeah, exactly. But I'm going to tell you, neither the interpretation of the NET scholars, translators, nor the interpretation of the liberal liberals is correct. Neither one is correct. Neither one. But I'm going to show you that this is another Old Testament proof for the Trinity. Are you ready for the proof? Neither the scholars translating NET and supplying the notes, right, are correct, nor the liberals. Okay? But I will tell you that this is another psalm that proves the triunity of God. Crack, not even Michael Heiser's view is correct. Okay, now let me explain Heiser's view. What do you mean, remind you which, Sam? I, I don't understand, Marcy. Remind you of which? Psalm 82, I'm sorry, it's Psalm 82. Psalm 82. Okay. Crack, let me tell you how Michael Heiser explains it. He explains it in lines of the first 
interpretation given here. Let me show you. Heiser tries to argue that the Hebrew grammar doesn't necessarily distinguish the God who stands in the council from the God of the council. This is Heiser's position. Let me show you again. Remember, they gave three possible interpretations. Here is the first one. Heiser believes this one. Here you go. This is Heiser's view. Some understand Eel to refer to God himself. In this case, he's pictured presiding over his own heavenly assembly. So Mike Heiser believes when it says Elohim stands in the assembly of Eel, that's simply another way of saying God is taking a stand in his own council. God is taking a stand in his own council. So it's not talking about Elohim in contrast to Eel. It's not saying Eel is different from Elohim. Elohim, the God who stands, is the God of the council. It is his council. He is Eel. That's his interpretation. You with me there? That's what Heiser believes. It's his own assembly. So he is the Eel and the Elohim. The God who stands is the God of the assembly. The God who stands is standing in his own assembly. It is his assembly. So Eel is not different from Elohim. Okay? That's what Heiser believes. But then he has to explain why the verb stand is used. Now, I have read his response. He has a paper on it. You can find Michael Heiser, Psalm 82, where he says the verb stand is not literal. It doesn't mean stand. It means that it's simply a metaphorical way of signifying that he is now coming to judge. Standing in the sense that he's arrived to judge. He's, he's <clears throat> convening the council to pass judgment. Now, those who disagree with him will say, that's stretching it. That's stretching it. Clearly, it says stand. It doesn't say sit. And then they bring in Psalm 82, verse 8 to say, it says, arise, O God. That's what Michael Heiser uses. He says, you see, it says, arise, O God, proving that he does sit in the assembly. And the liberals come back and say, no, that's stretching it too. Arise doesn't mean he's sitting. It means now come and judge. It's simply a metaphorical way of saying, come to judge and <clears throat> rescue the earth from its corruption. Not to confuse you guys, but the liberals and Mike Heiser and those who think like him go back and forth, both try to argue that the Hebrew grammar doesn't support the position of the other. You with me there? I hope I didn't confuse you. The liberals will tell you that Mike Heiser is wrong. The Elohim who's standing is not the God of the council because if he's the God of the council, he wouldn't be standing, he'd be sitting. Mike Heiser says, well, the verb standing is not literal. It's simply a poetic way of saying that God has now convened the council to pronounce judgment. And then the liberals say, no, that's stretching it, right? And then Heiser will go to Psalm 82, 8 to say, see, proof that he's not literally standing. Psalm 82, 8 says, arise, O God. See, if he's rising up, that means he's sitting. And the liberal says, no, that's stretching it. Because arise, O God, is simply a metaphorical way of saying, God will now come in judgment. It has nothing to do with him being seated or not. So they go back and forth. Back and forth. On Hebrew grammar. Now, unless you're a Hebrew scholar, I don't think the nuances of Hebrew grammar is going to solve it for you because it doesn't even solve it for the Hebrew scholars. Let me repeat again. Unless you're a scholar of the Hebrew language, appealing to the nuances, the shades of meaning of the Hebrew terms won't solve it because it didn't even solve it for the scholars who are arguing from the Hebrew. You with me there? In other words, knowing the language doesn't give you assurance or certainty that you're understanding the context correctly because Heiser knows Hebrew and these scholars know Hebrew and they're both disagreeing over what the Hebrew means. So appealing to the language isn't solving the problem. See the point? Is it making sense? So what, what does that do for us? Where does that leave us who don't know Hebrew? It leaves you with another option. Can I show you what the other option is? You don't need to appeal to the Hebrew. You don't even need to disagree that the God standing is different from the God of the assembly. 
The God standing is different from the God of the assembly. Do you know why? Because in light of the New Testament, the God who stands to judge is Jesus Christ. And the God of the assembly is his father. According to the New Testament. Can I now prove that? So if you follow this interpretation, you don't need to appeal to Heiser's interpretation and explain it away. And you don't have to accept the liberal understanding that Yahweh is an inferior God to Eel. You can admit, yes, Yahweh is different from Eel because that's Jesus, the son of Eel, but he's equal to Eel in essence, glory, and majesty and power. Can I prove it to you? Psalm 82, verse 8. This is another Trinitarian passage. Psalm 82, verse 8. Let me show you this interpretation. Now, do you know why Heiser and NET translators don't opt for this in interpretation? Do you know why they don't accept this interpretation before you quote it? Do you know why? Can I tell you all honesty? Why they don't say, yeah, that's Jesus, the son, who's now standing as prosecuting attorney in his father's assembly. Do you know why they won't, op they won't even mention that as an option? Because liberal scholarship will laugh at that. Liberal scholarship will say, oh, you're reading back later Trinitarian understanding in an ancient document. And these evangelical scholars don't want to be laughed at by academia because they're trying hard to get the respect of liberal scholarship. The hell with liberal scholarship. Yes. Yes, Pedro, I'm not lying. Go and present this as an option to Daniel Wallace or to any of these other scholars, they'll smile at you and smirk at you. Well, yeah, that's a later understanding from a later generation and a later perspective. But we don't want to read that back into the ancient Near Eastern cultural context of Psalm 82. Why not? Why not? It is, Pedro. That's why, thank Jesus Christ, our Lord Pedro, you do not care about the respect and the acceptance of academia, even evangelical academia. That's why someone like me or a James White too, we will never get invited to their conferences and their seminaries to lecture. We won't because we don't tow the party line. I'm just being honest. And thank God we don't. Lord Jesus, do not let us prostitute and whore ourselves for fame and fortune. Never, Lord but to be faithful to you by your power until death in Jesus' name. Okay? Are we now ready for this interpretation, which is backed up by Jesus Christ? Backed up by Jesus Christ. Jesus backs up this interpretation. Psalm 82, verse 8. Psalm 82, verse 8. Okay. Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Now notice, the God who's going to destroy the gods for being evil judges the earth and inherits all the nations, right? So pay attention to who this God is. This God will judge the earth. This God inherits the nations. And this is a God who's standing in the assembly to condemn the other gods, to damn the other gods. Who is this God that judges the earth, condemns these gods because they're wicked and evil, who inherits the nations? John 5, 22. John 5, 22 to 23. Here, John 5, 22 to 23. No, all nations are not the council. They're the nations of the earth, Andrew. Reread it again. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Now notice what Jesus says, folks. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Fact number one. Jesus is the God who judges all the earth. The Father judges no one. The Son does all the judgment. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. 
He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. Who comes to the earth to judge it and all the nations? Matthew 25, 31 to 34. Now, it's a long chapter. It goes from 31 to 46, but we're just going to read to 34. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The Son of Man comes with his angels to sit on his glorious throne, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Did you catch it? Jesus, the son of God, God is his father. He's the son of man who comes with his angels to sit on a throne of glory, a glorious throne, to judge the nations. You catch it? But Psalm 82 verse 8 says, Crack, you know I'm going to block you, right? How can he judge the gods of the earth in the earth when they're already in the council in heaven? But you know I'm going to throw you out for that one, right? And moreover, are you saying that Jesus judges just the earth but not the gods who corrupt the earth? But you're, you're, you're going to leave right now after this. But hold on. Why is he going to arise to judge the earth, meaning the gods of the earth, when he's already condemned them in the council in heaven? Did you read Psalm 82 verse 1? Are you a Heiserite blinded by what Heiser says? Because this judgment of the gods is in the council. Did you forget Psalm 82 verse 1? Do you remember Psalm 82 verse 1? God is in the council to condemn the gods. This is taking place in the council. Do you get that crack or no? Even your name is kind of prophetic, crack, you know? So why would you then make that comment and insult me and upset me by saying, arise to judge the earth doesn't mean the gods of the earth? Why does he need to then judge the gods of the earth if he's already condemned them in heaven, but the context of Psalm 82 verse 8 is clear. He arises to judges the earth to inherit the nations as his possession. But even if we go with your logic, according to the New Testament, who judges the gods of the earth? Your mother or my mother? Who's judging them? You see why I can't teach? I'm losing my patience in testimony. People like this with these kind of questions. You have patience. You can deal with them. I'm impatient. I'm a sinner. I want to bust his teeth. I want to headbutt him, smash his face in the wall, make him tap, and then repent. Why? Why allow me to do this and sin? Crack, did you get your answer now? Or do I have to, again, break it down and take it step by step? Change your name, bro brother. Crack, it's not suiting you. No, did you get it or are you just trying to appease me? Even if it's the gods of the earth, who does all the judgment? Who judges the gods of the earth and the earth? Your mother, my mother, my sister, maybe my 10-year-old daughter. It's her birthday after all. Who judges them? Okay, so why would you then interrupt the session and say, I thought it's the gods of the earth. If all judgment is given to the Son, that means he judges everyone. And the Bible does say Jesus will then use his spiritual body, the church, the members of his body, to judge the angels and others. So there is a sense in which your mother, if she's a believer, my mother, if she's a believer, and my daughter, who's a believer, will judge because Jesus will give us the authority to judge on his behalf. But who comes with the angels to clean house? Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. 
So the first connection tying in, tying in the God of the council who judges the gods with Jesus. Jesus judges the entire earth, judges all creation, judges the nations. Secondly, Psalm 82 verse 8. That God inherits the nations, right? Psalm 82 verse 8. Who inherits the nations? Psalm 82 verse 8. Who inherits the nations? God, God inherits the nations. Arise, O Elohim, judge the earth, for the nations are your inheritance, right? God, who is the heir of not just the nations, but of all creation? Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So wait, Jesus judges the whole earth, all the nations, all creation, and he's the heir of everything that is created. The God of Psalm 82 who judges the gods is the God who judges the whole earth and whom the nations belong as his inheritance. So then who is the God of Psalm 82 that judges the gods? The God who arises to judge the earth and inherits the nations. The New Testament, who is that God that judges all nations, all men, all nations being gathered before him? who comes as a son of man, the son of God, with his angels to sit on his glorious throne, to gather the nations before him. Who's the heir of all creation? The son. So Psalm 82 in light of the New Testament is saying, Jesus stands in the assembly of his father to judge the wicked gods for their corruption on behalf of his father, dispossessed them and saying, Father, it's now time for me to reclaim the nations and I will rule over them justly because they have failed and I will now damn them. That's what you have in Psalm 82 if you let the New Testament interpret it. Now let me give you further proof it's Jesus. Hebrews 1, 2, chapter 1, verse 2, verses 8 to 9. What do you mean, what is the term son of man? Son of man means he's a human being. He appears in human form, human semblance, because he became a flesh and blood human being. Hebrews 1, verse 2, verses 8 to 9. Watch here. It is from Daniel, but what does that mean? It means one who appears human, who has a human form, human semblance, a human shape. Hebrews 1, 2, and then verses 8 to 9, before the rapture. I said Hebrews 1, 2, and he gave me one. Brother, can I? Can we go to the hospital and see if you got Alzheimer's and coronavirus? Because I got a lot of toilet paper for you. Hebrews 1, 2, chapter 1, verse 2 and 8, 9. Hath in these last days, has in these last days spoken, pay attention now. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now notice who the son is. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. Ha theos in Greek. The Son is the God who rules forever and ever. A scepter, ruler staff of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. You rule righteously, justly. No incorruption, no evil. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God. Even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. What more proof do you need that as far as the New Testament is concerned, Jesus is the God who condemns these wicked, evil gods for being corrupt and evil and unrighteous because he is the God who is perfectly righteous, who loves righteousness, justice, and hates wickedness. When the New Testament has told us, he is the heir of all things. All nations belong to him. All judgment is his. 
He comes with the angels to sit on his glorious throne to gather the nations to pass judgment on them. What more proof do you need that from the New Testament, the God who stands is the Son, and the God of the assembly is his Father? You get it? So, where are the liberals right? The liberals are right in Psalm 82, referring to one God who stands and the other God who owns the assembly. So the Elohim who stands to pass judgment on the gods is different from the eel, the God of the assembly. Not because Israelite religion evolved into thinking that Yahweh was an inferior de deity to eel and then later combined Yahweh and eel together. Because the Old Testament is Trinitarian. Yes, Yahweh is the son of Eel, the son of the Most High. Yes, Yahweh is distinguished from Eel. But like Eel, he is the Most High God. He is uncreated. He is eternal. He's almighty. And Eel is also Yahweh. So you have two who are called Yahweh. One is the son of the other. So how does the Old Testament distinguish one from the other? By calling the Father, Il, Most High, and then calling Jesus, Yahweh, the Son of Il. And this is on the Old Testament. In other words, I don't have to do what Mike Kaiser does, explain away the Hebrew language and get into a battle about Hebrew grammar, which doesn't convince either party, because those scholars who also argue on the basis of Hebrew saying, no, you're wrong, you're stretching it, and Mike Kaiser says, no, I'm not stretching it. It's valid interpretation. Instead of getting into a battle about grammar, yes, you're right. This Yahweh is distinguished from Eel. But he's right that the true God of Israel is triune. So Yahweh is not a secondary inferior deity created by Eel. Yahweh is the eternal son who's eternally existed with Eel as his son. And with Il, he is God Most High, and Il is also Yahweh, like his son is. That's the proper way of interpreting these passages in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So then why doesn't Mike Heiser argue that way, or Daniel Wallace argue that? Because liberal scholarship will laugh at them. You don't believe you can use these passages to show the Trinity, do you? You don't think for a minute... That this Elohim who judges the gods, that's Jesus in his pre-human existence. Come on, man. You're reading later New Testament understanding into the Old Testament. You're trying to tell me that the Israelites saw a multi-personal God in these passages? Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. You can laugh at me. You can mock me. But I could care less about your opinion because you will stand before the feet of Jesus. And then I want to see if you're going to mock or cry when he damns you righteously to hell where you deserve to go for brainwashing, poisoning the minds of people to lose their faith in God's word. Right? You see how you can interpret Psalm 82 in light of the New Testament to show it's Jesus? Two more points, and then we're going to conclude this session. Let's read Psalm 82. We're going to read verses 1 to 5. Why is God punishing the gods of the council? Why is God punishing the gods of the council? Exactly. Andrew, one of my points is to show the gospel writers didn't make it up. Even the Jews understood there were two divine persons in Psalm 82. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But Psalm 82, verses 1 to 5. Let's read, guys. A psalm of Asaph. God, Elohim, stands in the congregation of Il. Congregation of Il, God. who ju He judges... Among the gods. So this Elohim is going to judge the gods. Where is he judging him? In the council. How long? And this is now, guys, pay attention who's speaking here. Pay attention who's speaking. The God who's judging is speaking. The God who's judging is going to speak. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. 
They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. So why is God destroying these gods? Here's why. Guys, follow with me and make sure you get it. Why is God destroying these gods? Because they're wicked, they're evil, they're unrighteous, and they're helping the wicked on earth to spread mischief, corruption, and evil in the earth. They're corrupting the earth. They're emboldening the immoral, the righteous, the poor, the meek, the widow. They're ignoring and allowing them to be oppressed by the evildoers. And so God says, enough is enough. Enough is enough. You've corrupted the earth. You allow the earth to become corrupted by violence, mishap, injustice. You've let immorality spread. The righteous suffer. They're oppressed. You've ignored the poor and the widow. Now I arise to damn you to hell, and I'm going to reclaim the earth and make it righteous again. Okay, you with me there? You understand why these gods are being destroyed? Why these gods are being destroyed? Okay, so now let's read Psalm 82, 6 and 7. Yeah, the rulers of the earth. I'll get to that interpretation in a minute. I'm just focusing on how you can interpret Psalm 82 to show it's referring to two divine persons, the Father and the Son, working together to destroy these evil gods. Psalm 82, 6 and 7. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. There's that word Most High again, Elyon. But ye shall die like men. The Hebrew is, ye shall die like Adam. Ke Adam. Like Adam who died, you will die like Adam and fall like one of the princes. Like all these princes who die, you'll die with them. So notice, though I said you're gods, Elohim, son of the Most High, Elyon, you are going to die like Adam died, and you'll be struck down like these other princesses for their wickedness because you are nothing before me. You pose no threat before me. I can kill you with ease, and you can't raise a finger against me. You got it now? But now let me give you further proof. This is referring to Jesus. Further proof, this is referring to Jesus, okay? These are the last two points. And then, God willing, I'm going to continue my session on henotheism, okay? But further proof, these are that this is referring to Jesus. Do me a favor, Protestant. Post Psalm 82, verse 6, back to back with John 10, 33 to 36. Psalm 82, verse 6, back to back with John 10, 33, 36. Guys, almost done. And then in a few hours, I can do the session on the Holy Spirit. We can make a double header if you're interested. So far, I got 117. Hopefully, we'll get 160 later. I want to see 200. I want to break that mark in Jesus' name. Okay, guys, read. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Okay, see? Psalm 82, 6 again. Pay attention. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now let's go to Jesus and the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. We're not stoning you for any good work, but you are a man, and only a man, nothing more, and you dare to claim to be God, the God-man. How dare you? That's blasphemy. You deserve to die. Notice what Jesus quotes. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. Whoa, Jesus. You just quoted Psalm 82, verse 6. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, do you say of me, whom the Father has set apart, has sanctified, and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, I blaspheme, because I said I, I am the Son of God? What more proof do you need? Psalm 82 is referring to Jesus as the judge of the gods. He even quotes it in defense of him being the God-man. Did you catch it? He just quoted Psalm 82.6 in his defense. Hey, if those wicked, evil rulers who will be damned to hell for being evil, if they can be called gods... 
How dare you even accuse me of blasphemy for saying I am the God man, the son of God, who's one with the father in power and ability and glory when that's truly who I am and the miracles prove it. Do you need more proof from the New Testament from Jesus himself? He is the God of Psalm 82 who passes judgment on the gods. Do you need more proof? He is the God who stands in the congregation of his father, the assembly of his father, to pass sentence and judgment and damn these wicked, evil gods to hell where they belong for spreading corruption, empowering the wicked, the immoral, and oppressing the weak, the poor, the widow, the needy, and the righteous. No, Jesus is not saying, I said you are gods. Psalm 82, he's quoting it. And in Psalm 82, the psalmist says, I said you are gods. Don't get confused. He's quoting it verbatim. <clears throat> right? Psalm 82, it's right there. I have said you are gods. He's simply quoting the psalm as it is. But I'll get back to that a little later. I don't want you to miss... All of these connections. Did you see it now? Do you want any more proof that Psalm 82 refers to Jesus as the God who stands in the assembly of his father, passes an indictment against these evil, wicked gods, and will now execute judgment and condemn them to death like Adam was condemned to die for his sin, who then arises to judge the earth and inherit all the nations? You need more proof? So yes, here's where liberal scholarship is right. Liberal scholarship is right. Psalm 82 is referring to two main divine persons. Il, the God of the assembly, and Elohim, the God who stands to judge these other gods. The Il, who's the God of the assembly, would be the father and the Elohim, the God who stands to judge these gods, is the Father's Son, who is one with them in essence, power, glory, and majesty. So they are right. There are two divine persons there. Where they're wrong is in their assumption. This is proof of an evolution in Israelites' religion. So that at one time they thought Jehovah was an inferior deity, second to Il. Most high, and then later Jehovah becomes ill. No, thank you, liberal scholars, for seeing something that Trinitarians should be seeing but are scared to admit it, lest you attack them for being fundamental fanatics and reading too much in the Old Testament. But by your own words, by your own concession, by your own words, you'll be judged. So, you are admitting these texts show clearly there, there is Jehovah. And his father, the Most High. And both are depicted as God. And there are texts in which Jehovah is said to be the Most High. And yet he's distinguished from the Most High, which is exactly what a Trinitarian expects to find, liberal. Jehovah, Son of Most High. And he is the Most High with his father. And the father is also Jehovah, like his son is. Welcome to the wonderful Old Testament world of the Trinity. Thank you. You just helped me prove the Trinity has been there from the beginning. Everyone got it? So yes, these texts show Jehovah is distinct from the Most High, Il. Yes, these texts show Jehovah is the son of Il. Yes, these texts show that Il the Most High gave Jehovah Israel as his inheritance. Yes, these texts so show that Jehovah is the Elohim who stands in the assembly of Eel, his father. Because according to the New Testament, that Jehovah who receives Israel as an inheritance from the Most High, his father, that Jehovah who's the God who stands in the congregation of Eel to judge the gods, is Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of the Most High, the Son of Eel. But here's where you're wrong, liberals. That Jehovah is not a secondary deity created by the Most High. 
He is eternal. He's one with the Most High, which is why he's also called the Most High. And his father's also called Jehovah too. Thank you, liberal scholarship. So Mike Heiser, stop arguing with them. Stop trying to show, no, these passages don't teach it. Say, you're right. That's why I'm a Trinitarian. Thank you for helping me prove to Trinitarians the Old Testament is Trinitarian from beginning to end. Praise the triune God of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Final point, and you're going to read this article. You know who also saw that the God who stands in the assembly was different from the God of the assembly? You know who also saw that? You know who also saw from Psalm 82, Elohim as separate from the God of the assembly? The Jews who produce the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some believe they're the Essenes. You know why? Because if you remember in a previous session, I'd mentioned this, and here's my article again. So we're gonna we're gonna conclude here. Okay, here you go. Here's my article that you gotta read. They discovered a scroll in Cave 11 of Qumran in the Dead Sea area. In Cave 11 in, in Qumran, in the Dead Sea area, they found a scroll in Hebrew talking about Melchizedek as a heavenly divine being. Did you know that this scroll says Melchizedek is the God of Psalm 82 who judges the gods? And the gods that he judges is Satan, Belial, and his evil spirit angels. Folks, you know what that means? Even the Jews before the time of Christ who were not Christians, who read Hebrew, mother tongue was Hebrew, saw from the Hebrew grammar two divine persons, the God who judges the God and the God of the assembly. And they identified the God who judges the gods as Melchizedek. That means even from their reading of the Hebrew, they saw the God of the assembly was different from the God who judges these wicked gods. So you can't say this is a Christian bias, a misinterpretation, because the Jews saw two divine persons, the God of the assembly and the God who condemns these wicked, evil gods. So it wasn't just Christians. The Jews saw it as well. Keith, why do you care if I debate him or not? Should I debate you and send you on your merry way? Why don't you debate him? Don't hide behind my, my pants. Get out of your dress and debate him for yourself. You got it there? Yes, you can. If you got a big mouth here to rant and complain, then you can do it. Okay, so you see that? Now... Again, let me repeat. Let me repeat. What more evidence do you need? What more proofs do you need? Psalm 82 is speaking of two divine persons. The God of the assembly and the God who judges these gods. And that from the New Testament perspective, the God of the assembly is the Father. And the God who judges is the Son. So that in that aspect, the liberals are right. Where are they wrong? There is no evolution. This has always been the belief of the true monotheists because the true triune God revealed himself to them from the beginning. Hey, Israel, the God of Israel is more than one person. You have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so that there is a person called Yahweh who has Il as his father, who's the son of Il, the highest, but not because he's a God that was created, but because the one true God that you worship eternally exists in more than one person, the Father, Jehovah's Son, and His eternal Spirit. And Jehovah is the Most High with His Father, and the Father is also called Jehovah. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity in the Old Testament. The Old Testament evidence for the Trinity right there in the Scriptures, preserved by the true God throughout the ages as an irrefutable witness against those who would say the Trinity is not a revelation of the Old Testament. It is because the triune God lives. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay, now, guys, it's 2 o'clock. If you guys want me to do another session, I can do one at 4.30 p.m. my time in two and a half hours. And the other session, the double header will be, is the Spirit 
a divine person. How many ones for me to do another session? That means we got 121 now. If you're going to say one, I hope to see more than 120. I hope to see 150, close to 200, God willing. Should I do a double header? So now it's 2.15 my time. In two hours and 15 minutes, right? Yeah, two hours and 15 minutes. 4.30 p.m. my time. Two hours, 15 minutes. We're going to do the Holy Spirit is a person. Invite people to come. I want more people because more people need to listen. I hope you're blessed. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And we love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Two hours, 15 minutes. Tell people. Don't make me sad. It's my daughter's birthday and the <clears throat> anniversary of my mother's passing into glory. I want to see 200 in Jesus' name. If not, I'm going to look, hunt down Protestant believer and lay hands on him and knock out first and the last. Okay, see you in two hours and 15 minutes, Lord willing. Christ is risen, risen indeed.